Dr. Odie doesn't know this, but last week we had uh, a bunch of uh, exhibitors come in late, and Lois runs this show. She runs a lot of the show. But anyway, uh, Lois, the 38th exhibitor, I let in a week ago Saturday. Well, the deadline was Friday, and you know how Lois is with debt. Yeah, administrators understand deadlines. But anyway, so I let the 38th one in, and she gives me a ream and that the fire marshal's going to be after me and all this. Well, anyway, one of her friends calls her on Tuesday last week, and she let the 39th, the 40th, and 41st <laughs> exhibitor in because of one of her friends. And I said, Lois, this is great. And so I went, I went on to prowl as I do, and I went down to my good friend in beef, Dale Blassie, not knowing that he was co-chair, you don't send out enough emails, of Cattleman's Day. And I said, not only are we going to be better than Cattleman's Day, we're going to be bigger. Oh my gosh, it caused an uproar. And so I guess Mother Nature's paying me back today by the change with the weather and everything. So we're going to have a great day. We ex appreciate all the exhibitors that came, and I know the trade show is going to be busy throughout the day. I want to overcap because we've had to change a few things in terms of the events today. Uh, the trade show's open all day until uh, 3 o'clock. The big talk in the morning, the special invited talk, and and about 15 minutes ago, they were still loading their slides, Dr. Hesse and Dr. Henry on PED virus. When I asked Dr. Henry in May, uh, I remember someone in the group saying, well, that's going to be an old disease by Swine Day. It may be old, but I think it's still relevant, Steve. It's still relevant in our industry. That We look forward to that talk. And then I want to introduce, back in the corner, Carl Jones, raise your hand, and John Budd that, that you on this truck that's out in the parking lot. It is an amazing video about the impact and myth about animal agriculture. I know it's a little different out there, but Bill Snyder said last night that we're going to practice in weather for Saturday, and so go on out to the truck and enjoy that video. It's phenomenal. Let's give those gentlemen a round of applause. A couple of us slipped out to the truck, and uh, the meat is phenomenal out there. I mean, Nichols, I should have got, you weren't here early enough, or you could have taste paneled with me. It was, it's really good stuff. Visit that truck. And then we're actually, this will work really good for Good Band, because we're having a meal inside and a meal outside. Okay. <laughs> and so if Keysucker, I'm not trying to drop names here, but if Keysucker catches you eating three times, you can say you were out at the truck, see? And so there's going to be pulled pork, and it is phenomenal to truck, boneless loin, courtesy of Soother Foods and Farmland. And we actually moved the, the uh, feeding. If you get hungry, Berkstrom, if you get hungry early today, uh, 11 o'clock, they're going to have food available out at, the, out at the booth, and it's a phenomenal video. Then lunch next door as well. And as Dr. Odie pointed out clearly, I, I don't know why it took us so long to get the renowned feed mill expert in the world. I got back from China about three weeks ago. Bob was there as well, and they all know Dr. Charles Stark that came back from North Carolina to run our new feed mill. And not only is he going to present the recent technology in feed mill design, but then to kick things off uh, later in the day, he's going to give tours, and uh, we're going to heat up the mill a little and have ice cream, call hall ice cream out there as well. I put K-State ice cream, and somebody chewed me out. It's supposed to be call hall ice cream. Okay, we'll get it right. I just want to highlight a couple talks real quick here that uh, research areas that are in posters out here. One of the areas that Dr. Dwayne Davis, and I don't know if Dwayne, yeah, in the back, Dwayne Davis, our reproductive physiologist, uh, and Hyatt Frobost, and I, I thought nobody's going to know Hyatt until I went and looked at our posters, and Hyatt's whole poster is his picture. And so Hyatt's the one, no, he's going to kill me for saying that. But anyway, Hyatt's worked on this project where we have tried to find ways to stimulate estrus and ovulation during lactation. And Dr. Davis gave me the right to talk some about his data, you know, with the movements of the industry. And again, a lot of it's in the video out in the truck. We're under some challenges in terms of finding ways to transition away from gestation stalls. And so... We went back and looked at the literature, and we decided as a group that maybe we should explore ways to possibly breed sows, Steve, while they're still in the farrowing crates. Give it a try. And the reason we did that is because when Dr. Davis and Dr. Uh, Jeff Stevenson did the research in the 70s, we had totally different genetics. And the question was, these high-producing white line sows, can we get those sows to uh, come into estrus during lactation? And again, we looked at the literature and it said if you reduce the suckling stimulus and suckling, suckling stimulus and provide boar exposure, it's possible. So we designed at our little farm out here at K-State either a traditional 21-day lactation period 
or an altered suckling that I'll describe to you in the next few slides. The altered suckling uh, stimulus in our lactation house went like this. We divided the pig, for illustration, we divided the pigs into two groups, the big pigs and the little pigs. We simply moved the larger pigs at 18 days of age, we moved them to our nursery, we weaned them early for our situation, 18 days. And then we took the combined lightweight pigs, and this illustrated five pigs. Wayne, you're with me here, aren't you? Five, okay, thank you, sir. Five pigs per treatment. And we moved those then to make a new litter, okay? And then what Haya did is every 12 hours, we rotated to reduce the suckling stimulus, we rotated those pigs from to, two, to two different sows. In the meantime then, he also gave these uh, sows then, there were still lactating pigs, boar exposure, because the literature said boar exposure, there's been some argument that boar exposure is important. And so he moved daily, moved those sows from our farrowing house. Nichols, this isn't my technology, quit laughing at me over there. <laughs> you you want to give this, Nichols, if you think it's so fun? Okay, this is the sow data. This is the actual performance, okay? And what we found was that we can indeed stimulate the modern sows to come into estrus, much higher percentage than Jim Nelson thought. Matter of fact, the altered suckling uh, sows, 89% of those came into estrus and were bred during lactation. This was, for researchers, Duane, we were quite excited. This is a much higher percentage than that we've seen in the 70s with the, the traditional genetics. And in fact, not only did those sows stay pregnant, 89% farrowing rate, but their subsequent reproductive rates, both in terms of number of pigs born alive and litter weaning ways, were excellent in our production system. And so, just to illustrate by bar graph form, we were able to move this population of pigs considerably forward, represented in blue or purple here, move those sows earlier into estrus, breeding during lactation, and yeah, you look at the bell-shaped curve, we got Dries, you'll see this outlier out here. This is a sow that we actually altered, suckled, but she didn't eat very well. We all have those during lactation, and she didn't return to tell uh, the post-weaning period, uh, come back into estrus, and was, was bred at that time. Additionally, the pig performance was exciting, and here's what was exciting about it. We were able to not only get equal performance, even by weaning these pigs at an earlier age, 18, or the later sows are weaned at 25 days, get equal gains during the last week of their lactation or the first week post weaning, but we were able to change the standard deviation or the variance of the population. And that's what meant a lot to me because for about the last 15 years in industry, when I go to any major swine meeting other than swine day, People talk about cookie cutters, getting these pigs more uniform, flowing pigs through the nursery, same size, same full value at the end of the market period. And that's illustrated uh, in this slide of how that actually worked. If you look at the actual different weights of the pigs, when we weaned the heavier pigs early, we actually hurt their performance, which is a bad thing. And when I talked to Hyatt about this, he thinks we maybe didn't feed budget these pigs properly. But the good news is, follow me to the other side of the slide. The good news is those lighter weight pigs we were, that we altered suckled, we were able to bring their weight up significantly by taking the heavy pigs off the sows, and that's what brought the standard deviation of the variance of the population down. We were able to make a more uniform set, not cookie cutter, but a more uniform set of pigs. So the summary of this data is we were able, exciting in Dwayne Davis in my eyes, to get 89% of them in estrus during lactation, and tremendous opportunity to reduce variation and we're gonna track this out into commercial operations. Matter of fact, Hi had asked if he'll still speak to me after making fun about that picture. We would like to do this in a commercial setting. We'd modify it significantly so it's more Joe, more practical for the real world, but at the same time, we think it has bright future. Combined with that uh, is a new technology that was released. Yeah, Mar Mike Johnson, welcome back. JBS United has a new product that was available in June of this year, I think June, June, July. Ovugel, which is needs, is used for time insemination and actually uh, will synchronize ovulation in sows. I want to briefly talk about that. It is a GNR, GNRH antagonist, which means it stimulates LH release. And what you can do with this product is you can actually, uh, 48, 40 to 48 hours after you give this uh, Ovugel into the va uh, vagina of the sow, they'll come into estrus and you can time inseminate. And Dr. Odie will love that because I remember a lot of your research early on was synchronization programs for cattle. And so we're, you'd say we're catching up with you, right? 
We're catching up with the beef industry. Well, that's unheard of. But anyway, you breed these sows 24 hours later. And I just put this in a timeline. Uh, if you wean sows today on Thursday, uh, eligible sows at weaning, four days later, which would be what? Monday morning, Mike? Monday morning, you give the ovule gel. And then Tuesday morning, you actually inseminate those sows. No estrus detection. You time inseminate and uh, you're able then to uh, uh, get uh, really good fertility rates. And I actually, Mike, I pulled your clinical data uh, that you guys submitted for clearance. Five different trials, and I know you were heavily involved in this, we appreciate that. But what they found, in, in when they, the data submitted to the FDA, large data sets as you have to have, a uh, large number of sows is, they actually seen an increase in farrowing rate in sows that were given ovugel, no change in litter size, and they use in their data what's called a pig index, number of pigs born alive per 100 sows that were exposed. And in every trial, I do, I'm not going to show all of them, but they increase the number of pigs uh, per eligible sows bred. And I did pull out a couple trials here just to show uh, smaller trials. But uh, as I talked to veterinarians across the country this week, I asked if you use this technology. Many of them are just starting to. And the, and the, the common uh, reason that they told me they were using it was for uh, summer infertility, when you have a lot of silent estruses or you can't find those sows in heat for breeding, that they're using Ovugel. And in every one of the trials that I looked at, uh, of the eligible sows that were bred, you increase, uh, not always statistical, but you increase the farrowing rate. And this is in, you know, people always say, well, that last slide you showed, Jim, didn't have a real high farrowing rate on average. Well, even in high farrowing rate herds, uh, you see an increase in farrowing rate. And then also in one of the trials, smaller study, uh, they also see an increase in litter size, born alive. And again, it's early enough, as I talked to the consulting veterinarians across the country, they said that, you know, they haven't seen that yet, uh, but uh, it's still in the discovery stage in terms of utilization of that product. Okay, with that, I want to wrap up and say next week's Thanksgiving. Uh, Dr. Potter loaned me her slide. She always makes cool stuff, you know, Steve, even for your birthday last year. And I guess the Kramers deserve credit. I tell people, you know, rather than eating that turkey next week, we need to have pork. And it, it reminds me to thank some people for the program today. Dr. Uh, Nichols, uh, you didn't get enough credit for the student growth in that department. It is unbelievable. For the students that are visiting today, talk to our teaching co coordinator. There's a lot of awards gave out in our department. This guy's the MVP. When you see student numbers go up like he's driven and his teaching faculty, it is unbelievable. The second group I want to thank is the grad students, all your work. Hyatt's upset with me, but we'll get through that, you know. But the rest of you, great work on all your posters and research this year. And finally, for Lois and her team for putting together registration. She'll never take credit for this, but I'll tell you what. I remember when you dedicated the female, you came in and you said, so we got to get Lois on that committee because it needed a little work. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Bob Goodman. Yep. Now, Bob, there we go. Let me shut it off. Thank you very much, and again, welcome to Swine Day. Uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, one of the frequent questions that I always get is, what day is Swine Day? And it's always the Thursday before Thanksgiving. And as Jim pointed out in his uh, earlier slide, we have a lot to be thankful for. And the first thing, as Jim mentioned, uh, I'm always thankful for the grad students. And why don't you guys stand up and be recognized? Yep, go ahead. Go ahead. I use the term we a lot in our, our research program, and when I say we, just automatically cross that out. That has nothing to do with Bob, uh, and it has everything to do with the graduate students. So thank you guys very much. We're very thankful for you. The other thing that we're thankful for is the audience, you guys. And we couldn't do the things that we do without you. You take us to the next level, and uh, we sincerely appreciate your support and attendance. So thank you guys very much. And as Bill Snyder says when he comes to the games, let's go and get it started. <laughs> so for a big game tomorrow, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll uh, prevail. And I put a big score in for the football pool, so we're going to win big. Uh, today, my charge is to talk about distillers and give you an update on distillers. Uh, Going to talk a little bit about the economics of medium and low oil distillers uh, in diets. 
uh, we're also going to talk about the concept of fiber withdrawal or DDG withdrawal. Uh, we've talked about this a little bit in the past about taking the distillers out of the last diet or two uh, in order to help with carcass yield. And so with that, uh, start with some research and quickly go through a project uh, that we talked about last year, pigs fed a corn soybean meal based diet or 20 or 40% distillers, 20 or 40% distillers. Uh, distillers were 5.4% oil, a relatively low oil distillers versus a relatively uh, medium uh, high distillers, not the 10 or 11% that we're used to, uh, but 9.6. And as the data shows, we saw absolutely no differences in average daily gain with uh, lower oil distillers. But what we did see was poor feed efficiency. We saw about an 8% uh, worsening of feed efficiency when we fed the low oil distillers versus very little difference in feed efficiency when we fed the higher oil distillers. And so what that led us to, to conduct uh, additional research that Amanda Graham and Jessica Updike, uh, uh, an undergraduate student for her undergrad research project, was to do digestibility trials looking at various sources of DDGs with different oil levels, ranging from the 5.4 in the previous study, 7.6, 9.4, 9.6, and 12.1 percent oil. And the take-home message of this slide is with the help of my ocular statistics, there's a linear trend in net energy value as we increase the oil content of distillers. Now, I need to point out one thing. We're starting to look more and more at net energy values that Steve's going to talk about later this afternoon as opposed to the traditional metabolizable energy or digestible energy. And that's because now we have high fiber ingredients in our diets and that changes uh, the energy profile uh, that we typically look at. And so as we formulate diets now, we're taking a look at net energy as well. And so what happened after that, uh, Seremus Nitikachana uh, did some regression analysis to predict the energy value of DDGs with different oil contents. And the variables that she looked at was the oil content, the crude protein, the crude fiber, the acid detergent fiber or neutral detergent detergent fiber that if you're ruminant nutritionists or have beef cattle, uh, you're pretty familiar with. Uh, we also looked at, we uh, looked at particle size and bulk density, and oil was the only factor that was found to be significant in this regression equation. And so this is what Ceremus came up with, uh, oil contents from 12 to 5 percent, and we see a reduction in digestible energy as we decrease the oil content and a reduction in energy content, uh, net energy, as we reduce uh, the oil content. And the point I want to point out here is that the regression coefficient, the higher the value, the better, uh, explains 86% uh, of the variation, or oil explains 86% of the variation uh, within the energy content, where digestible energy wasn't quite as good. And so again, points out the importance of using net energy that as we formulate your diets, uh, that that's what we're taking a look at, especially if we've got distillers in the diets. So what that led to was we, namely Mike, putting together a spreadsheet that's on our website, ksuswine.org, uh, that you plug in your corn price, your soybean meal price, some of your other ingredients like dical, limestone, uh, the amino acids, and importantly, your DDG prices, and uh, some other variables here. Most important, the oil content of the DDGs, uh, but putting all those variables in and looking at the regression equations, uh, coming up with values for what we should be doing for DDG levels. And so what it says, 25% in phase one, 15%, five, five, and 10%. And with $200 a ton DDGs and $4.25 uh, uh, cents per bushel corn, basically it's telling us that our DDGs are only saving us about 17 cents a pig. Now, the challenge is, 
that this is probably a pretty darn good price for our Kansas, Nebraska, and Missouri friends, uh, and that the price probably more realistic for you guys is going to be $220 plus dollars per ton. And what this means when we increase the uh, cost of DDGs, keep everything else the same, uh, we're losing about 90 cents a pig. So again, we really need to be cognizant of what the price of DDGs is relative to corn uh, because we are starting to see it price out of some diets. The other variable that I think is very important is the oil content of DDGs. And if you remember the previous two slides, we talked about DDGs containing 8% oil. And here we have uh, the first scenario with $200 a ton DDGs that was saving about uh, 17 or 20 cents per pig. If we lower the oil content, which reduces the energy content down to just 7.5%, we go from a net positive to a net negative of losing 20 cents per pig. And so again, what this illustrates is the oil content is extremely important in valuing the DDGs. And so it's very important that you test or work with a company uh, that will test the oil content of DDGs to help determine uh, the energy value there, because that can be a very big factor as well. Another factor uh, that comes into line is the tryptophan content. And if you're able to purchase L-tryptophan, that really increases the value of the, of the DDGs. Again, we've got $200 a ton DDGs, 425 corn. Now we're saving approximately $2 a pig if we can add crystalline or synthetic tryptophan. Now, the challenge with that is that we're talking about very low inclusion rates of tryptophan. And so if you're uh, with a feed mill, your feed mill, uh, you really need to evaluate whether you can be adding a tenth of a pound uh, uh, two-tenths of a pound inclusion rate, uh, but we're starting to see more tryptophan available now. Uh, we use it like crystalline lysine or methionine or threonine that we've been using before, uh, but that has a big impact on the value of DDGs because we're able to further lower the soybean meal level and balance on some of the fourth and fifth limiting amino acids uh, to save uh, value there. So check the oil content, uh, uh, look at the opportunity for your other ingredients, and as I said, work with someone who can help you uh, put together diets as well as determine the oil content. Now, the other thing that the uh, spreadsheet comes up with for those of you like me that are, are tabular challenged uh, is this nice chart that shows you how much DDGs to be feeding in each one of those phases. And what this slide shows that in your first finisher diet uh, that we should be feeding about 25% DDGs, 25% in phase two, it's gonna save us 16 cents per pig, uh, then cut back uh, to 15, 15, and then uh, uh, looking at the chart, 10% DDGs. And so again, all these different options that the spreadsheet can help you with. And again, it's located on our swine website, kswine.org. Now, I want to talk about some of the negative effects of DDGs on pig performance, and most importantly, that's the effects on carcass yield. And this is some of the original data from the University of Minnesota looking at the effects of feeding either 0, 10, 20, or 30% DDGs in the diet. And what you'll notice is a decrease in carcass yield. And what that means is we see a decrease in car hot carcass weight. But as we feed higher fiber ingredients, that fills up the digestive system. That fills up the large intestine, and that affects carcass yield. And so what we've done, Matt Asmus, a graduate student, a former grad student in our program who's gone on to begin working on his PhD, he fed pigs all corn soy based diets or diets containing 19 or 20 or 30 percent distillers and 19 percent wheat mids. And again, as we pointed out, 32 or 30, 73 percent carcass yield, 
versus 71%. But what was unique about Matt's research is that we fed high levels of DDGs, high levels of DDGs in the next phase, and then dropped out the DDGs in some of these other late finisher diets, and we were able to recapture yield. And so this is where we've come up with the concept or, or, or what people are doing in their diet formulation of reducing or eliminating the DDGs in the very last diet to help restore carcass yield. And again, pointing out the reason why we see those differences in carcass yield, this is the weight of the large intestine, the full large intestine, and basically when we feed high levels of DDGs, the carcass yield decreases because we've got more content in the large intestine. And so again, that's an important criteria. When we reduce the DDGs in late diets, uh, 23 days before market, uh, we're able to reduce some of the contents of the large intestine. And that's that gets us our yield back. So thinking along those lines, Kyle Koble uh, conducted a study where he fed pigs corn soy based diets all the way through market or again our high fiber 30% DDGs and 19% wheat mids and the pigs read the protocol perfectly. Uh, they had about uh, a percent and a half decrease in carcass yield but what Kyle did was five days before the pigs were slaughtered he went and fed them, switched them to a corn soy diet, or 10 days or 15 days or 20 days before slaughter. And what he saw was a quadratic response that as the duration of withdrawal increased, carcass yield came back and was similar to that of the corn soy diet. So uh, we wanted to follow up that research. We took it out to the field, uh, to New Horizon Farms, and again, we fed the corn soy diet or the high fiber. Uh, we saw about a percent reduction in carcass shield. We wanted to target the same duration, the 5, 10, 15, and 20 days, but you might remember back in, in December and January when we had that really heavy snowstorm and the packing plants closed down. As a result, we had to hold those pigs an extra four days, and so we're looking at four, 14, 19, and 24-day withdrawal. But the take-home message that we're looking at is that about a 10 to 15-day withdrawal going back to a corn soy diet is going to help maintain or restore carcass yield. And so looking at some of the economic evaluations, uh, at the time of the study, uh, 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 looking at, at that, we had relatively low pig prices and relatively high grain prices. This top line represents pig value, the bottom line represents feed cost. And what it told us there was adding high fiber diets was economical. Because of the high feed cost, because of the low pig price, you know, we were adding lots of DDGs to our diets and it was saving about 60 cents a pig. But if we withdrew the DDGs and went to uh, the corn soy diet, again, 10 to 15 days, 19 days before those pigs were marketed, uh, then we saw an improvement in yield. That improvement in yield helped carcass weight and we actually uh, were able to gain a little bit more value uh, per pig compared to our corn soy diets. However, when pig price, if we take the June two, uh, 2003 prices, as pig price increased and feed costs stayed the same, now our high fiber diets start to cost money. And that's what we were illustrating in those previous spreadsheet slides that uh, 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 as, as, as the value of the pig increases, the value of the DDGs because of the yield, because of the slightly slower average daily gain starts to decrease. And so there feeding the corn soy diet uh, had about a $2 advantage, $1.50 advantage than feeding the high fiber diet all the way through. But again, the withdrawal strategy was the most economical. And so again, it's, uh, it reduces the potential risk uh, that we would have of feeding high levels of fiber all the way through. And so if we look at prices now in September, again, as corn prices decreased, 
as illustrated here, corn price uh, and DDG price has increased. Now it's not economical at all to be feeding high fiber diets. But again, if you are, if you're on that edge, uh, the withdrawal diet, again, is the least risky. Uh, but again, here, because of low corn prices, relatively high pig prices, intermediate pig prices, uh, we're better off with corn soy diets. So again, there are a lot of variables that come into feeding DDGs. It's oil content, uh, whether you're going to add fat to the diet, the fat price, uh, whether you can use crystalline tryptophan in your feed mill, and again, uh, as I mentioned, the oil content uh, of the DDGs itself. So with that, removing pigs from high fiber diets, uh, the reduction in yield, it looks like that if we have a withdrawal period greater than five days uh, uh, in that 10 to maybe 15 day range, uh, we can recapture the yield. Uh, we can capture uh, the advantages in carcass weight appear to increase with 15 to 20 days of withdrawal. And again, if we're feeding low oil DDGs or things like wheat mids, that's where the opportunity lies in uh, pulling those diets and going to corn soy just before market. One other thing to point out, uh, uh, removing the DDGs or removing high fiber is not the same as taking out the unsaturated oil. When we take out DDGs, uh, we do take out unsaturated oil, uh, but with a shorter withdrawal period, we're able to go ahead and resume or, or recapture uh, carcass yield. We need a much longer withdrawal period uh, uh, in the neighborhood of at least 21 and probably 42 days, depending upon upon the level of DDGs that you're using uh, to recapture uh, or start to get iodine value back to a reasonable level if for those of you that are going to Triumph Foods and have that set maximum at 73 uh, for the iodine value. So with that, that concludes my presentation and I'll turn things over to Joel. All right. Thanks, Bob. Again, welcome and appreciate everybody coming in. I'm going to back clean up for us this morning, really over the next 15, 20 minutes, I'm, I'm charged with talking about a number of feed additives. And so I'm going to cover a variety of topics in the next little while. And so when I make those transitions, if you're already falling asleep on us, which you shouldn't, for Dr. Goodman, Bob actually uh, is an integral part of our undergrad teaching program on the swine side, has the second largest swine production class if you look at land-grant systems. Also last year was recognized as the advisor of the of the year for College of Ag. And so again, appreciate all he does for the undergraduate side here. Hey. All right, so I'm gonna talk about phytase. This isn't a necessary for all the nutritionists and those in the industry, this isn't a new topic. For the producers in here, you should realize if you don't know a lot about phytase, you've probably been feeding it for 10 years, all right? Phytase is a feed additive that we utilize in our monogastric diets to increase the phosphorus digestibility or availability for the pigs to use, the phosphorus in our grains. And why we do that? The phosphorus in corn is only about 18% available. And for all those, and uh, Gary Keeler, and I work on the manure side, uh, what becomes very evident in pigs is that when we feed a corn soy diet, our digestibility or availability of the phosphorus in the soybean meal and corn is very pathetic vast majority of it comes out the back side. So when we're doing our manure management plans and we're on a phosphorus basis, it really cranks up the acreage we need. When we dump or put phytase in the diet, which is economical, been economical for several years, we, we lower the amount of total phosphorus, we reduce the amount coming out the back side, it makes our plans balance much better. So this isn't new, we've researched this, many other, uh, other people as well. The next step in this is that some of the initial research that looked at phytase, not only to improve the phosphorus digestibility, questions come, if we're improving phosphorus, what else could we maybe get? Can we get more energy? Are we breaking down some of the phytate, which is a compound that holds a number of our digestible components intact? We need to break it up so the pig can utilize these other, to other substrates in the, in the grain and diets. And so basically what we're looking at, I'm going to talk about in the next few slides, is well, a term that we refer to as superdosing. Basically adding an amount above that of what we'd expect just for our phosphorus release. And so to see if we can get more nutrients, better growth from utilizing that type of regimen with phytase. 
So we've done several studies over the last year. A number of other institutions and commercial facilities have gotten involved with this super dosing concept as well. And I'm going to talk about a couple of those. Uh, we've done with some different sources. Again, uh, there's been a lot of other work done. The sources we worked with with, with the Ronazyme HIFOS, Optifos, and Quantum. Uh, we did a series of experiments both here at our K-State facilities as well as in, in commercial facilities. I'm going to talk about some differences that we saw based on environment um, in terms of the response from the superdosing side. So the first study I'd like to talk about was done up at our partners at New Horizon Farms. Uh, this, was, this experiment was set up with the concept that can we feed extra phytase above what phosphorus release we're going to get can now we release actually some of the amino acids that maybe we're not getting digested as well? Can we formulate a diet that's lower in lysine and bring the response back up by adding more phytase? And so that's what we're trying to do in this study. So we have high, and high is actually, uh, across here we have the two diets that were fed. What we call high lysine was at the pig's requirement. And this is starting at about a 24 pound pig. So that phase three, a 24 to 50 pound pig is what we're looking at in this study. In the low, this was a deficient lysine diet. It was about 15 hundredths lower in lysine. And basically then we titrated more phytase in to see if we can bring the performance back to the normal diet that we typically feed. So this would be the normal diet typically fed. And this 250 um, a level of phytase met the phosphorus requirements. So any level above 250 would be above what we would expect for a phosphorus response. And you'll see in this study, as we fed more, up to 1,000 FTUs per kilogram and leveled off, we we're in fact able to bring back on an average daily gain basis or release and get some performance back from that case. But also point out, when we feed lower lysine, and this is not a new concept, but the importance of when we don't, when we feed under the requirement, how poor performance can get very quickly. And we're going to see that throughout in several different slides in different sections today. From a feed efficiency standpoint, really again brought us back to uh, the, uh, the numerically. We had the a low versus high. There was no differences as we looked at a feed efficiency basis on the low lysine diets at the increasing amount. But again, numerically, that thousand match where our average daily gain was. Again, this was in a co commercial setting um, with lots of pigs in, um, in that case. We also did a study here back um, with a with again looking at the concept of two lysine levels, again the 1.2% would be adequate or meet the lysine requirement of this group of pigs. The 1.05 again would be in the deficient state. You'll see that there was effect high versus low as we would predict, but there wasn't a phytase response in terms of the 500 meeting the phosphorus requirement and then the 3000 being our superdose level if in fact it provided an effect. Again, this study was done in our university setting, and we didn't get a response in this particular case. Same way with feed efficiency. You'll see when we fed the, the deficient lysine diet, feed efficiency got uh, certainly worse, very evident, but again, not a phytase effect. And so again, uh, I want to point out, done in the research facility where we had less pigs per pan, a little less environmental stress, a little higher feed intakes, Wondering if that didn't maybe explain some of the differences that we saw, because as we get into some of our other commercial experiments in nursery especially, we got a more consistent response. Now if we look on the finishing side, much of the work done with superdosing had been done with the nursery pig. We wanted to take it into the finisher again at New Horizons, we're able to get in one of our finishing groups, and again look at Optifos in this case. Again, a 0.25 pounds, would have met the phosphorus requirement. So anything, the three bars on the right, would be increasing levels above that of what we'd expect. We already met the phosphorus requirement. So if we got a benefit, it was from the increased potential release of either amino of nutrients, and especially in the form of energy. You'll see that there was no differences in, in finishing as we went across, some numerical jumping, but some no differences as we superdosed on average daily gain. For, for uh, Feed efficiency, we had a cubic effect, and basically what we're seeing here is we saw an improvement as we increased, um, especially as we went to the 500 FTU level from that of, of our control or our normal diet, and then basically plateaued off. So again, a little bit less consistent, and I think that would probably match up some of the other work in terms of a clean response, probably a little less in finishing than what we've seen in most nursery data, ours and others, 
But again, something there in terms of from a feed efficiency standpoint, still we had some numerical and had that cubic type effect. The last study I want to present was done again in a commercial setting uh, with our partners at Horde Farms out in Ohio. Uh, what they, in this particular study is a little bit different where these pigs, this is in the wean pig. So this study was done from the point of weaning through about 24, 25 pounds or up to that phase, typical phase three type of weight range. In this particular program, there was no phytase. And the reason that oftentimes producers may not use phytase or not give phytase credit in the starter pig diets is we have high levels of zinc. High levels of zinc have been shown to negatively affect the, the efficacy of phytase. And so what they wanted to look at is a no phytase diet, then superdose up to 2,500 FTUs per kilogram. And you'll see in this case from an average daily gain, as well as feed efficiency standpoint, significant improvements in this commercial environment by utilizing phytase. And these no phytase diets would have met the phosphorus requirement. So any additional benefit would have come from either additional energy, nutrients to help support those effects. What does it mean economically? From an income over feed cost, from a day zero to 11 when they were fed the initial pelleted diet, or the next 10 days when we combine it all together, again, statistically improved economics by having, a, it costs us money to put that extra phytase in, but when we found the benefits of growth, it's been economical in, in almost all those situations when we find that in our commercial conditions. So again, I think there's still certainly more to be looked at, timing, amounts, a lot of different products out there, we're able to find some consistent responses. So again, similar to other previous studies, these experiments really show the importance of feeding, not underfeeding lysine, and how important that is in nursery, how much uh, performance can be impacted. There appears to be differences as we look at these studies from the type of environment that they're fed, and again, just making sure our diets are balanced to um, an increasing lysine level. And I think before, you know, we need to get more person, I need to get more comfortable with reducing a lysine amount and bringing that phytase or assigning an amino acid value to a superdose value. But I think that'll come with more research so we get a better comfort level of how to formulate those diets correctly. All right. Going to transition into uh, we just, uh, this last year, uh, Cassie Jones, uh, part of our grain science faculty, was involved with some experiment looking at the use of other enzymes. And uh, this project was worked with John Bergstrom in, in our DSM group, uh, looking at two things. Uh, during the 2012 year, we had a lot of drought stricken corn. Questions on is corn quality going to be an impact? And so they found high quality and dr more drought stricken corn as judged by bushel in terms of uh, yield. You can see in this case, let's look at this first, there was no difference and an average daily gain would be the same, that there's no difference between the normal and the drought stricken corn in this particular study. If we look at feed efficiency, again, different enzymes, but these are kind of a cocktail going after some of the non-starch polysaccharides. And you'll see overall, when they were, these diets were fed, there was a tendency for roxozyme G2G to have that effect. And actually there's a statistical effect right after weaning. And this is, our, again, uh, as we look at enzymes, we've done a lot of enzyme work, others as well. It's just really kind of looking at some of the new products, looking how to target them, what other ingredients need to be in the diet to get the biggest benefit. And that was, that's continued to evolve, but certainly some promising potential enzyme work that's been done. We'll continue to look at that uh, in these types of settings. All right, going to completely switch gears. We're going to switch now to the very last diet in finishing that is being fed, and we're going to in the paline diet. Certainly, the use of paline uh, has become a very commonplace for most producers. There's been obviously understand some of this, the export issues, and some packers have provide incentives or provided paline fl free flows, but still for the majority of producers still utilizing paline as a feed additive to add value to those pigs prior to marketing. More data has been coming out over the last few years that maybe we need to be looking at some of the nutrients that we're supplying during that stage because as lean growth increases, remember if we feed paleen the last two to three weeks, we'd expect six, eight pound heavier pig, a lot of that's in lean muscle, okay? What other nutrients besides amino acids are we needing to supply to get optimum growth and efficiency during that stage? One of those that's been looked at is zinc. 
And zinc is in all your diets. And in terms of in the trace mineral premix, we include it in every swine diet at a basal level to meet the requirements. What this work has done is do we need to feed more than what we typically historically would in that premix to get, an average, to get a response in terms of growth. So several studies were done. Chad Polk. Uh, Chad, are you in here? I didn't see you stand up. I was a little worried all the grad students are huddled together, OK? Isn't Chad? Working on prelims, okay. So Chad has his prelims. Uh, Chad actually was just hire, hired. Uh, he's going to be starting on faculty down at Texas A&M uh, in August. So we're really proud of him. I was a little worried he's maybe out signing autographs for extra money, uh, taking the Johnny Manziel approach. Uh, yes, yes, yes. He's very resourceful. Um, and uh, we're really proud that he's going to be able to be on faculty and uh, advance the swine nutrition in their group. And one thing that he's, a big chunk of his PhD work has been involved with the feeding of zinc to pigs that are being fed paling to help understand that response and look at different types of uh, products as well. And in this particular study, um, Elanco is a partner in, in a lot of this work as well, looking at hot carcass weight. And we have a control diet, so that'd be a typical end of finishing diet without any paling. Then we have a paling diet, and you'll see as we'd expect, a significant improvement in growth rate over this last, in this case, 35 days that it was fed when we fed paling. That'd be a typical response. And then we look at paling plus added zinc in either two forms, zinc oxide or avela zinc. And avela zinc is a chelated form, very commonly used in a lot of different uh, livestock species. And again, as we look at source, you'll see that there was no um, source effect, nor was there an effect in terms of um, adding zinc, but you'll see in where it's going to become important, and this is not typical to most data that's out there. If you look statistics only, which we need to on the scientific side, all right, oftentimes we don't get an effect of improved, a significant amount of growth from just feeding the zinc, but there is numerical increases as we look out. And where this becomes important in all of our trials, and a lot of the other trials that have been done, if we look at the economics, certainly paline was economical. And again, if we look at no difference in source, no difference in level, okay? And there was some bloops and we would not have expected that with Avela Zinc and that's probably a little different than some of the other work. We generally do not see a difference between sources um, or, or numerically uh, not as high as zinc oxide. But what you'll find is when we add about that 75 extra ppm, numerically that's still a valuable dollar amount a dollar to a dollar and a quarter. That's real dollars for producers. And so we need to make sure we're looking at the economics. This just takes a whole lot more replications when we're dealing with some of these statistical differences than maybe what we're able to find in this type of work. So where's it going? Why do we need more zinc? Well, as muscle tissue develops, we have more um, zinc deposits in muscle. If we have more lean tissue, it's obviously going somewhere. One of the things, too, is we look at from a liver standpoint, again, no statistical differences, numerically dropped a little bit, but then you'll see that we, as we fed more zinc, as you'd expect, you feed more zinc in the diet, we are what we eat, all right? We eat more zinc, zinc level in our body is going up, all right? It's just the way biology works. And so, obviously, expect more zinc being deposited in. There was an interaction, and we'd expect the available zinc to be more available, have a higher level that builds within the pig. Interestingly, in plasma, and again, we're dealing with very small differences, but I do think meaningful from the standpoint is when we fed paline, it's really hard to change a lot of blood parameters in an animal. Um, and you can really do that by either sucking more out, in this case, by putting more lean tissue, more zinc going in that way. But you'll see, again, there wasn't statistical. We're getting closer to a trend, a decrease. But when we added zinc, again, because we had more in the diet, we had more in the bloodstream, is more than potentially going for that lean growth. Again, trying to help explain why that is. In a second experiment, looking at zinc oxide and Avela zinc, in this case, we just had 50 ppm. 28 days, and you'll see again a nice paline effect, no differences between sources, okay? And as, but as we get to income over feed, which again is our bottom line, again a nice paline effect, we made money feeding paline as we'd expect, but again numerically 
we had improvements when we fed the zinc oxide. Again, so, or in, in either zinc source. And the added zinc is a very low cost investment. Many producers have adopted that. Some haven't because they're not sure if there's enough confidence yet. As we continue to do the trials and put on an economic basis, I would feel there's very little reason not to. Now, the reason that we don't want to go overboard, and I'll get to that maybe on here, is from an excretion standpoint. As we look at, there's no rules coming that I've ever seen yet on copper and zinc levels. Unfortunately, if we follow a European model, which I always get so excited to say we're always behind Europe 10 years. I'm not sure why we always say that. Um, they do start looking at that. So we're going to have to watch our levels so we don't build our soil levels and manure levels. But again, as we look at that, but again, the 50 to 75 PPM has been fairly consistent, providing us an economic advantage, something for us to continue to look at. All right, going to switch to the other mineral, copper. Um, historically, copper has been added into diets uh, to pr pr promote growth during the, the late in the nursery, early finishing stage. We wanted to go and evaluate some of the levels. The industry levels can range from 75 to 250 PPM. Data on tri-basic copper chloride was limited to a newer source. Uh, traditionally, copper sulfate's been used. If you ever had a dye and you see the little blue specks in it, those blue specks is what's really the copper sulfate, okay? And so again, wanted to look at a new source. Uh, Kyle Koble, uh, one of our grad students, has been involved in this research. Uh, James Usher with Micronutrients has helped support a lot of this work. This was done at our partners at New Horizon Farms. In this study, we had a couple things going on. We wanted to, uh, uh, one objective was to evaluate a corn soy diet versus a high byproduct diet that had distillers and bakery in. But what I want us to evaluate is from the red bars and the titration of 75 or 150 ppm added copper to this byproduct diet. On an average daily gain basis over the entire finishing period, you'll see that there was an improvement in growth rate for either copper source that was added. Interestingly, for the tri-basic, most of the data would show that once pigs have hit middle, middle to towards late end of finishing, that there's no copper response to be found. It's more early. Um, one of the reasons that the tri-basic, in this particular case at the higher level, uh, maintain that all the way through a little bit more. And so that's uh, why we have a little bit higher level as we continue to go out to the 150 level for the whole phase. From a feed efficiency standpoint, again, if we look at copper sulfate linear, it gets worse. Tri-basic copper chloride, no effect at 0.11, the close tendency. And the reason that feed efficiency, again, we wouldn't always expect feed efficiency to get worse feeding copper, but copper stimulates feed intake. Feed intake goes up. Average daily gain goes up. Feed efficiency generally remains flat, okay? In this case, they both ticked up just a little bit. So we don't feed copper, extra copper for feed efficiency. It's more of a growth rate type response. From an income over feed, our bottom line dollars and cents, you'll see again there, were, there was no differences between copper sources, okay? But again, as we look at the dollars and cents, economical to feed at 75 for either source or 150 at the uh, 150 level for tri-basic. From a wash time, one of the, the pushbacks producers often have is, or we've heard, is that when I feed copper, my wash time increases. It takes more time to clean the barn out. And so what we've been able to do on several studies up at our New Horizon, they'll actually time, how about this one? So along with power washing, they'll time how long it takes them to clean that pan to what they feel is what their normal routine is or protocol. And so the two take home messages, one, and we've done this on a couple different experience measures between a corn diet, corn soy, and a byproduct diet, significantly increases wash time. So when you feed distillers and bakery in this case, it took more time to get that pen clean versus a corn soy. But as we look at copper, no differences across. And so in this, and we looked at texture, we looked at several things, couldn't find anything different from a wash time or manure characteristic for either source of copper at either level. Well, the last one, the last studies Kyle did is we talked about it, preference. And when you give, it's like today, okay, so we're going to go over here. You're not given a preference today. Your choice is pork loin or pork loin. Um, you're going to eat pork loin. But if we had the choice today of pork loin or flame and yawn, I'll just throw the good, the highest beef quality, I would suspect even though we're at a pork meeting, there'd be a couple of you trying to sneak that flame and yawn, okay, or both. Okay, I could like that idea. Given a choice, what will the pigs prefer to eat or not to eat? 
And in this case, what we had is a control diet. This was 150 ppm of either copper source. What we saw is when we had two feeders in a pan, switched them around every day. I say we loosely. All right. The feeders got switched around each day. And basically, the pigs could seek out what they wanted to eat. In each case, they preferred to eat a diet that did not con contain copper. Okay. But it was a little bit less negative with tri-basic. And then we put, gave them the choice between the two. They preferred more, or would, they ate more of the diet that contained tribasic compared to copper sulfate. And this kind of goes back to why we saw the feed intake and growth responses maybe a little bit more with tribasic in the feeding study. Again, when, we got to be careful how we evaluate when you're not given a choice or given a choice, but trying to help explain some of that effect. So with added copper summary, adding supplemental copper either as copper sulfate or tribasic uh, improved growth. Pigs fed tribasic continued to have improved growth rate and late finishing, especially at 150 ppm. And when given a choice, they prefer to eat a diet without copper, but when not given a choice, they'll prefer between copper sources to tribasic slightly more. And so again, just trying to help figure out some of the responses, kind of interesting work that Kyle helped us uh, follow up on. Okay, with that it's 11. Keep going or should we shut her? All right, I'm going to finish with a couple slides on tryptophan. Um, and tryptophan is, is one of our essential amino acids. It's generally third limiting in diets. And the reason that we're talking about this, um, just a couple slides, is we've been, not only is it one of the amino acids that we try and set a requirement for, it makes a big difference in your diets economically in terms of how much soybean meal potentially gets pulled in where we set or where your nutrition is set, how much tryptophan you want to have in the diet. The other thing, and, and uh, Kevin Touchette uh, with the Genomoto is here, uh, been helping us with some other tryptophan research looking at requirements, but also the availability of synthetic tryptophan is more available. For uh, well over a decade, probably 15 years, almost every one of your diets has had synthetic lysine in it methionine and threonine, we're seeing more availability and as we move forward, going to see more diets with synthetic tryptophan in as well as one of the amino acids in the diet. And again, there's a lot of difference in potential requirements and so what we want to do is we're, we're continuing to do work, but look at some different studies. And again, here's a group of studies looking at different ratios. And you'll, you're going to see on these lines is the different points of the different researchers that fed. And to break this down a little bit is where you have the optimum, which is starred, okay? And you'll see ratios here, where this star here is about 14 and a half, goes up to about just over 20. But where the majority of these studies are is in that 18 to 20 range. But the thing we want to point out is this here. In most of these studies, once you fall below the tryptophan requirement or that amino acid requirement, it goes down, your performance goes down really fast. And what we're continuing to find is even if we formulate slightly at or over, your income over feed economics or your risk of decreased performance is much less. It still costs more money to continue to go out, but the risk given environmental conditions and ingredient variation is much less. And so there's a lot of debate what tryptophan level should be, but as we continue to get more data and compile it, the risk of being low certainly in our minds starting to weigh that of being at a, at a level where the income over feed cost does not change very much even if you're slightly over, okay? And we've set up a number of different experiments and this is kind of a, a, an example of an experiment where we're trying to test different levels. This was a model that we used uh, subsequently in a number of trials looking at the effect of, there's a lot going on here between crude protein, the lysine level of the diet as well as the ratio. And basically what we're trying to show here is, is that this, from the standpoint of a lysine, yep, pigs, when you feed low lysine, they're going to grow less. And that's back to the importance of having your lysine amino acid level set correctly for optimum growth rate. But also from the standpoint is when you decrease the tryptophan ratio, again, significant decreases to, to, uh, we find in terms of average daily gain, worsening again in this red bar in terms of feed efficiency. And so we're continuing to take this, apply it to a number of other studies. Next year, we'll have much more information published in our swine day um, in terms of trying to help nutritionists and producers set optimal levels of tryptophan because it becomes very important when we look at uh, the economics and where we set those levels in your potential diets.